Well, last Sunday after uh, preaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and the reality of the resurrection that in Jesus Christ we know we have the gift of eternal life, that because Jesus lives we know that our loved ones of the Lord now live with Him in paradise. My wife and I went to the movie theater to see a, a movie called After Death. Has anyone seen After Death? Yeah, a few of us. It's done by Angel Studios, which is the same studio that helped produce The Chosen. Uh, the Chosen is a, a, a popular TV series right now that is about the life of Jesus. And it's a good little evangelism tool because After Death interviews, it's a documentary, parents, it's rated PG-13 uh, because it talks about heaven and hell, and hell's a little scary. But it's a documentary where it actually interviews people who miraculously, uh, they, they died, they, clinically they were dead, and then they came back to life and were able to tell of their experience of whether they visited heaven or hell. For instance, one of the people that they interview is a Don Piper. Uh, he wrote the book, 90 Minutes in Heaven. You may remember that in 2011, he actually preached in this pulpit. I got to meet Don Piper. He's a very nice man. He was from Texas. He was in a horrible car accident, and after the car accident, he was dead, flatlined for 90 minutes, and then he came back to life miraculously. Well, I told Don when I met him, I said, man, Don, it's amazing that you, you died and you, you went to heaven, and now you've come back to tell us all about it. And he said, yeah. And I wish I was still there, you know. Heaven is such a glorious place. And when he came back to life, he had a lot of pain, a lot of physical pain. He had to go through a lot of surgeries. Life was hard, but heaven is glorious. One of the other people that they interview in the movie uh, After Death is uh, John Burke, who authored this book, Imagine Heaven, that I mentioned last week. John Burke, of course, is the pastor from Austin who looks at over 100 near-death experiences. And he helps point out the commonalities between these near-death experiences and what Scripture teaches. For instance, a common theme in these near-death experiences is that someone dies and their spirit or their soul leaves their body and they can see their body and then they ascend to heaven where they get to see Jesus in paradise. You may remember that as we talked about last week in Luke chapter 23 when Jesus is crucified in between two criminals, one criminal mocks Jesus but the other criminal on the other side recognizes that Jesus has done nothing wrong and so he tells Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus tells this confessing criminal, truly I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. The Greek word there is paradisos. It came from a Persian term that the, the Persians used to describe their beautiful gardens. In fact, when the, uh, they are tr when the Jews were translating the Hebrew uh, Old Testament into Greek, the Septuagint, which uh, after Alexander the Great conquered much of the known world, Greek became the language of trade, and so they decided to translate the Bible from Hebrew into Greek and called the Septuagint. When they were getting to Genesis chapter 2, describing the beautiful garden, or Gan in Hebrew, the beautiful garden of Eden before the fall, before sin, they decided to use that Greek word, paradesos, to describe that garden. In fact, you may remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that we looked at last May, the Apostle Paul has a, a near-death experience where he, he goes to the third heaven, now, the first heaven is the heaven that we'll see when we walk outside, blue skies, the sun. The second heaven is the heaven that we see when the sun sets and we see the stars and the moon and the galaxies beyond. The third heaven is even beyond that, and Paul describes that as paradise, paradesos. John Burke points out that people who die and know Jesus, they go to paradesos, and they encounter Jesus, and they do a, a life review where they get to see their life and have to give, basically there's two questions that Jesus asks of them. The first question is, what did you do with the life that I gave you? This is very similar, as John Burke points out, to uh, the parable of the talents that we read in Matthew 25, where Jesus tells that at the end of time, people have to give an account for the way that they use the time, the talents, and the treasures that God had given to them. And as they do this life review, the second question that is asked of them is, well, who did you love? Who did you love? which is the second most important commandment according to Jesus in Matthew 22. And so as this life review is happening, people get to see how their life impacted others, both negatively and positively. In fact, Dr. Mary Neal, who was interviewed in the movie um, After Death, who's a, a medical doctor, she died while kayaking in Chile. She drowned, went to paradise, encountered Jesus, and got to do a life review and she shared that she was able to see how her words, both good and bad, impacted people, not just the person who heard them, but how there was a ripple effect to 25 to 30 people, her actions 
made a difference in the life of others. Well, as people go through this life review, oftentimes they feel a little convicted, often shameful, guilty, because, well, sometimes we don't say good things, right? In fact, Jesus says in the Gospels that we will be judged for every careless word that we speak. And so as we speak careless words, sometimes they have a very negative effect. And, and as people are beginning to feel guilt for some of the ways that they hurt other people, whether intentionally or unintentionally, they don't feel condemned, though, by Jesus. For as John Burke points out, and as Paul writes in Romans 8, chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so they don't feel condemned by Jesus, they only feel loved, recognizing that as Paul writes in Romans 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates His great love, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the price for all of our sins so that we could be reconciled to God and have a right relationship with God. As Jesus says with those final words on the cross in John 19, it is finished. Our sins have been atoned for, and now we can live a right relationship with God as we turn to Jesus in faith. Yes, He's done for us what we can never do for ourselves. He lived in perfect obedience. He paid the price for our sins so that we are no longer condemned. Unfortunately, not everyone accepts the love of Jesus while they're on this earth. In fact, some people, because of their pride, their selfishness, their egos, they reject the love of God. Like Howard Storm, who's mentioned in Imagine Heaven and also interviewed in the movie After Death. Howard Storm was an ardent atheist who rejected God, and he was a professor of art at a, at a university in Kentucky. And he had gone to Paris, France on a field trip with several students to show them the great works of art of Europe. And while he was there, he had an internal bleeding. His stomach had a hole in it, and he started to die internally. And they rushed him to the hospital in Paris, but because of social medicine, there wasn't a, a doctor readily available to operate upon him. And so he actually died. And like so many, his spirit or soul left his body. He could see his dead body and his wife grieving over his dead body. And he was trying to talk to her, but she wouldn't hear him. And so he went outside the hospital room to try and see other people that might help him. And he saw these people who were ushering him and asking him to come down this dark, dark, dark hallway. We began to follow these people, but he really soon realized that these were not people. These were actually demons who began to attack him and torment him and tear at his flesh. And in desperation, he cried out to God. And you see, Howard Storm didn't, didn't go to church at the time, but he did remember as a little baby or young boy, he had learned that wonderful song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so in desperation, he cries out to God and says, please, Jesus, help me. And instantly, he's delivered from the torment. And miraculously, he comes back to life. And Howard Storm had such a radical experience in this near-death experience that he leaves his tenured position as an art professor and he becomes a pastor, a minister of the gospel, where he now lives in Ohio. Yes, all of these people who come back from these near-death experiences had a radical change take place in their life. They saw things they never thought they would see, and they come back and they, they tell doctors about what they've seen. In fact, in the movie, there are several doctors who are interviewed who are skeptical. They aren't necessarily Christian, but they have to bear witness to the fact that they've had several patients who die flatline, clinically or dead. They come back to life, and they begin to tell the doctors about things they saw or they heard, which would have been impossible because they were dead. For instance, there's a woman named Maria. She dies in the hospital while they're operating upon her. Her spirit, soul leaves her body, and she can hear what the doctors are saying, and she can see what they're doing, and she begins to relay to the doctors what she saw and what she heard in the operating room. But not only that, she tells the doctors, oh, and by the way, there's a blue shoe left-footed on the roof of the hospital. It's a bit of an eyesore. You should probably remove it. The doctor's like, what? A roof, a shoe on the top of, how did you go see that? Oh, I saw it while I was on my way to heaven. You should take, get rid of it. The doctors go to the roof of the hospital. There's the blue shoe. Unbelievable. Many of these skeptical doctors are beginning to realize there's something to these near-death experiences. Yes, that gives us a glimpse of what happens when we die. But in order for us to get the full picture of what happens to us for all eternity, we need to continue our reading, our journey through 1 Corinthians. So I'd invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, picking up where we left off last week in verse 35. It may be found on page 1223 of your Red Pew Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 35. But before I read God's Word, let's call upon His Holy Spirit again to guide us in the reading and, and preaching of His Holy Word. Please join me as we pray. 
gracious and loving God, I thank you so much that by your Holy Spirit you inspired Paul to write this powerful letter of encouragement, instruction, and hope. So God, I pray that as we read these words that you might encourage us, that you might direct us, and that we might receive the hope you want us to have. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your holy sight. Through your son's precious name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 35. <clears throat> Listen to God's word. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as He has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for the star differs from the star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, as was the man of dust. So also are those who are of the dust, and as is the man of heaven. So also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is a law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Now, concerning the collection for the saints... As I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. Here ends the reading of God's Word. As the prophet Isaiah tells us, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our Lord stands forever. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll look again at that first verse I just read, verse 35. Again, I keep that Red Pew Bible open on page 1223. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You may remember last week we talked about the fact that well, the Corinthians are Gentiles, they're non-Jews. They were not raised on Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3 that Austin read so beautifully just a moment ago. They had not been taught about a general resurrection of the dead that the Old Testament speaks about. In fact, they had been trained on the philosophies of philosophers like Plato, who believed in the eternal nature of the soul, but he really spoke on reincarnation. The idea is that the soul would leave the body and then reincarnate into either an animal or a woman or <clears throat> some other person. But it wasn't a body, the soul did not return to its original body. But we know from Scripture, from Genesis chapter 2, that the body exists before the soul. For God takes Adam and forms him from the dust of the ground, and then he breathes life into Adam, and Adam becomes a living 
soul. And the body and soul are therefore united, intended to stay together and even to be reunited as we read about in the resurrection of both Daniel chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In fact, we know from Psalm 139 that each one of us has been knit together in our mother's womb, that the pages are written in God's book for us before any one of them comes to be. And so the body and the soul and the spirit are all formed together, and they're intended to stay together. But with the Platonic thinking of ancient Greece, the Corinthians thought, ah, well, the body, it's temporal, it doesn't really matter. So what we do with our bodies doesn't matter, does it? We saw when we went to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 6, and 7, what we do with our bodies makes a big difference to God. For Paul condemns the sin of incest, fornication, and prostitution that were taking place among the Corinthians because they were acting as if they're, well, what they do with their bodies, since it's temporal, doesn't really matter. But our body, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And we would not unite the temple of the Holy Spirit, Christ's body, with a prostitute. And so Paul encourages the church in Corinth to be, well, in 1 Corinthians 7, to be chaste in singleness or faithful in marriage between one man and one woman. Yes, our bodies are very important to God. And we could see, as we saw last week in our text from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 23, that we will one day be raised as Christ was raised. Again, look at those words. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Christ is the firstfruits of the resurrection. Just as Jesus died and rose again on the third day, you may remember in John chapter 20, he appears behind closed doors for his disciples, and he has a very physical body. A body that they could touch. In fact, he tells them, touch the holes in my hands or the piercing in my side. They could see and they recognized Jesus. And he had a very, very real, real body. Jesus didn't become an angel and neither will we. Now we will, it's true the scriptures say we'll be like angels, but we actually become, we've become human beings with new, resurrected, powerful, uh, immortal bodies. Like Jesus had an immortal body. I love the way that Eugene Peterson in the message translates 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 57. After talking about how God has created animals with a certain type of body like birds and fish and, of course, uh, other animals. And that's what Plato thought. You could become a bird or you could become a fish. He's like, no, it's not like that. Those are unique animals with their own souls. But we actually have our own soul and we'll become human beings with new bodies, not uh, incarnation, re re reincarnated like uh, Plato taught. And then, Paul, and then Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57, the way Eugene Peterson translated it from the ancient Greek to the contemporary English. But let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I'll probably never fully understand. We're not all going to die. When Christ returns, we will all be changed. We might not all be dead, but we'll all be changed. He goes on to say, but we're all going to be changed. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet. When you hear a shofar really loud, end of the world, be ready for that. It's going to be awesome. And in the time that you look up and blink your eyes, it's over. On signal, from that trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At the same moment and in the same way, we'll be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will come true. Death swallowed by triumphant life. Who got the last word, O death? O oh, death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening, and law code guilt that gave it sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now in a single victorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ. Thank God. Yes, when the shofar is blown, Christ will return, and the dead in Christ will be raised, and those who are still alive will be taken up with him in heaven, and we'll be given these new imperishable, immortal bodies. And they'll be very similar to the bodies we have now, but they won't they won't perish. They won't decay. Because the truth is, we're all aging and we're all decaying in some way. I felt this last Thursday night. Um, a few weeks ago, I was asked to coach my son's Kids Inc. basketball team. I really didn't want to do it because I'm really busy right now. And I told the lady, I'm really busy right now. She said, well, but there's 10 boys who have signed up for this team. And if nobody coaches, they won't have a team. And she said, and you've coached before. 
I know you do a great job. I'm like, oh man, I guess I'll do it, right? So I coach this team, and Thursday night, I'm trying to teach the boys how to run a fast break. Well, I'm not as fast as I used to be. It was kind of a slow break as I'm trying to demonstrate to them. I'm kind of gingerly running down, down, the, down the court three or four times like, man, I'm winded. I'm getting out of shape here. This is not good. But in heaven, it won't be like that. We'll be able to have imperishable, strong, healthy bodies. And, and we'll even eat. In fact, you may remember in John chapter 21, Jesus makes breakfast for his disciples and he eats some fish. And we read in Revelation chapter 19 that there'll be a great wedding banquet for the Lamb of God for Jesus. And we'll celebrate as the bride of Christ with Jesus, his resurrection and his glory and in all of his victory together. Which reminds me of a story. Uh, there was a couple... <clears throat> who at the insistence of the wife always tried to eat healthy foods so they could live as long as possible. And so she made nothing but kale salads, you know, cucumbers, Brussels sprouts, and bran muffins. Never letting her husband eat any fried food, processed food, or desserts. Can you imagine life without dessert? That would be miserable. In fact, the other day I came back from the grocery store and my wife noticed in the grocery bag that I had two bags of chocolate. One was York peppermint patties, and the other was um, little Hershey bars, little uh, miniatures that we'd given out at Halloween. My wife asked me, you know, what's up with the chocolate? You know, ha Halloween's over. Were they on sale? I said, no, they weren't on sale, but the peppermint is for my breath, and there's those special dark chocolate that has antioxidants. That's for my heart. So <laughs> Sarah didn't really buy it, and now she calls me the, the sugar pusher. I'm the sugar pusher, pushing the sugar. I like to say I'm the joy giver, right? I'm giving joy out to people. So anyway, this couple went to heaven after dying in a tragic car accident at the age of 95. They lived a very full life to get to heaven. St. Peter greets them there and says, look, this is the mansion you've inherited. Look how beautiful it is. There's an 18-hole golf course connected to it. Oh, and by the way, there's a clubhouse with an all-you-can-eat buffet. Let's go check it out. The husband was eager to see this. He gets there and he can't believe how big the buffet is with all the fry food, processed foods, and desserts you could possibly want. But then he looked at his wife. He said, well, this looks great, St. Peter, but my wife doesn't want me to eat that kind of bad food. Is there a salad bar? St. Peter looked a little confused. Well, yeah, there's a salad bar over there, but you, you know you have an immortal body now. You, you can eat all you want. You won't gain a pound. And the man smiled big and said, oh, this is great. I love heaven. And then he looked over at his wife. He said, you and your kale salads, cucumbers, Brussels sprouts, and bran muffins. If you'd have let me eat what I wanted to, I could have gotten here a lot sooner. Heaven will be awesome. But until we get there, there's actually something we have to do. Look again at verse 58 of our text. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. What does it mean to be steadfast? Well, of course, it means to be faithful, to be steadfast, to not be swayed or immoved, moved by the different philosophies or ideologies or, or political uh, ideas of our current day. Now, to be steadfast in the Lord is to be always faithful to His Word, to do what He calls us to do. And so what does that look like in our lives today? To be truly steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I believe what it, it looks like what Paul talks about in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 to 17, where he writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whether you're a doctor or a, a nurse, or a teacher, or an attorney, or a construction worker. Whatever you do, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what Paul said, that before he instructs them to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. If we want to do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we need to let the word of Christ dwell within us richly. How does the word of Christ dwell in us richly today? Well, thankfully, we have, the, well, we have the Bible inspired by God. We have the gospel, specifically of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, that tell the faithful accounts of what Jesus said and what Jesus did. 
And so if we want the word of Christ to dwell in us richly, we need to spend time in his word. Specifically, we need to, we need to read the gospel accounts and, and memorize much of what he had to say. Now, if you've never read the Bible before, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. Begin in the gospel of Mark. It's actually the shortest gospel written. It was the first gospel written, written by John Mark, who was a missionary companion of the apostle Paul, but he's also a pupil of Peter. Peter told Mark much of what to write. It was inspired, of course, by God. It gives us a faithful account of what Jesus had to say. After reading Mark, which is only 16 chapters, then read Matthew, then read Luke, then read John. And after you've read the account of Jesus, finish reading the rest of the New Testament, and then go read the Old Testament. Because ultimately, all of the Bible points to Jesus. And we need to start with Jesus. Because in John's Gospel, he tells us that Jesus is the Word made flesh. The ultimate revelation to us of who God is and who God's calling us to be. And so we need to read the Scriptures through the lens of Jesus Christ, who is the great I Am, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Of course, when reading the Bible, it's not so important how much of the Bible you can get through, but how much of the Bible can get through to you. We need to read the Word of God in such a way that we allow it to dwell within us. We need to meditate upon it, even memorize it. You know, I used to read through the Bible every year. I'd read three or four chapters a day during these different reading plans. After doing that for 14 years, that was very helpful. But I I took a class from Dallas Willard, and it changed the way that I approach reading the Scriptures. Now I just read one chapter a day. It's true, it'll take me three or four years to read the whole Bible, but I'd rather take time slowly meditating, even memorizing what it is I'm reading. You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> uh, in uh, Colossians chapter 3, it tells us that we should uh, let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. A wise person doesn't try to read the Bible in isolation simply by themselves. No, a wise person reads, on the, reads the Word of God, meditates on the Word of God, even memorizes the Word of God, but then they also discuss the Word of God with other followers of Jesus, that we are the body of the Christ and the head cannot say the hand, I don't need you. We all need each other in order to understand what the Word of God is saying and how we might rightfully apply it to our lives today. If you're not in the Word of God, you know, it's interesting, Eugene Peterson, who uh, translated the Hebrew and the original Greek into contemporary English translation called The Message, which I quoted just a moment ago, he used to teach a, a class on spiritual formation at Regent Seminary, and one of his students took the class, and he was overwhelmed by all the different spiritual practices that the church has practiced through the years, like solitude and silence and fasting and meditating on Scripture and, and praying. And, and he went to Eugene Peterson at the end of one of the classes and said, I, I've really enjoyed this semester, but... These are so many spiritual practices. Which one should I, if there was one I was supposed to do faithfully, which one would you recommend? Because I, I just don't know if I can do all of these. And Eugene Peterson said, the best thing you could do for your spiritual transformation is to meditate, memorize, and pray a different psalm each day. It's interesting to me that the psalms, the prayer book of the Bible, is in the very middle of the Bible, which at the very middle of all of our lives should be a, a prayer life grounded in the Word of God. And listen to what Psalm 1 says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Spending time meditating on the Word of God, allowing the Word of Christ to dwell in us richly, allows us to see the rest of the world through the lens of God's holy, inspired Word. With our 24-hour news cycle, it's very easy to become anxious and thinking about all the troubles of the world. But if we'll read the Word of God and meditate on it and allow it to dwell within us, then we won't be so anxious because we know that our God is in control, that nothing can separate us from love of God that is in Christ Jesus, that He will be with us to the very end of the age. But listen again to what Psalm 1 says. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates day and night. The Hebrew word for meditate there also means to murmur. It's saying the word of God to yourself, reciting it, allowing us to be ever mindful of God's great love that is revealed to us through the words of Christ. Yes, Paul instructs them in the Corinth to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. One of the ways that we can demonstrate that we are steadfast in our faith, immovable, abounding in the work of the Lord 
is in the way that we give. Notice that after this encouragement in verse 58, he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 16 to 1 to 4 that they should continue to gather that collection that they're gathering for the church in Jerusalem. Now to put this in context, the church in Jerusalem was made up of primarily Jewish Christians who had spent their lives raised on the Old Testament. They knew about the resurrection of the dead that we read about in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. And they'd isolated themselves for the most part from Gentiles because they wanted to be God's pure and holy people. The Corinthians, on the other hand, were, were Gentiles. They were non-Jews. They weren't raised in the Old Testament Scripture. And they were very wealthy. And the church in Jerusalem was struggling. And so the Apostle Paul was encouraging all these Gentile churches to bless the mother church, the original church that was founded in Jerusalem on that Pentecost Sunday, to give them some resources they might thrive and flourish. You know, the fastest growing church in the world today is not in the United States. Ironically, it's in Iran. In fact, the church in Iran is growing exponentially as an underground church as people are coming to Christ through visions and dreams and satellite television and satellite radio as the gospel is preached there. The church in China is growing quite rapidly as well as it is in Africa and South America. Now, the church in America is not the fastest growing church, but it still is the wealthiest church in the world. And as you look at our operating budget, you can see that we committed that we're going to continue to give 12% of our operating budget to global and, and local missions so that we can help help bless others knowing that we've been blessed to be a blessing. That we might help that church in Iran grow and the church in Bolivia and the church in Egypt and the church in Ireland and the church in Spain. We want to help others grow as a, as a witness to God's great love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whatever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. In light of that reality, may we seek to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord as we meditate on God's word and we seek to live it out by being the loving, generous people God's called us to be. Please join me as we pray. Gracious and loving God, I thank you so much that you inspired Paul to write this letter of encouragement and instruction and direction for the church in Corinth. I pray, Lord, that as we read these words this morning that we would find joy in knowing that heaven awaits us, but while we're still here. You have work for us to do. So, Lord, help us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And we know that one of the greatest works we can do while we're on this earth is to invest in the work of your kingdom by giving to other churches who need help. We're so grateful for the way you've blessed us, Lord. Help us like Abraham was to be blessed, to be a blessing. Help us to do all that we can with the time, talents, and treasures you've given to us so we might bear witness to the generous love of our God. We pray this in the strong and precious name of your Son, who is the Christ, and all God's people said, Amen.